Perry. And on this episode, I'm back to talking about the great anti-federalist speeches of Patrick Henry in the Virginia ratifying convention in the summer of 1788. There he laid out much of the anti-federalist case against ratification without amendments. That was uh, one of the primary approaches. And I covered all of his speeches and I think six, seven or eight episodes. And today I've got a little highlight reel of the main positions that Henry took during those debates. Now, kicking it off in his first speech, this is June 4th, 1788, he warned against forming a great consolidated government instead of a confederation. His real big push was against centralization or consolidation of power and all the different ways that that would play out very badly. And he goes on in that speech saying that this is a consolidated government is demonstrably clear. And the danger of such a government is, to my mind, very striking. He continued, my political, and this is what he first noticed. He's pointing out like, okay, if you're looking at this document that we're supposed to consider, there's a kind of a glaring issue. And I know there's some opposition to this as well, but we're just pointing out Patrick Henry's take here. My political curiosity, he said, exclusive of my anxious solicitude for the public welfare leads me to ask who authorized them to speak the language of we, the people instead of we, the states. And he explains why. He said, states are the characteristics and the soul of a confederation. If the states be not the agents of this compact, it must be one great consolidated national government of the people of all the states. He did not like that. Now, he was not opposed to making changes. Uh, some people think that he just wanted to keep the Articles of Confederation. A lot of anti fellows just wanted to keep it. Now, in general, that's not the case. And he makes that very clear here. He said, the federal convention ought to have amended the old system. For this purpose, they were solely delegated. The object of their mission extended to no other consideration, but he was concerned that they were coming up with a completely different approach. And he was not on board with that. And he warned that this was a dangerous potential step. But he said, if a wrong step be now made, the republic may be lost forever. Now, in his second speech and in a number of other speeches, he repeatedly put emphasis on the, his view that liberty ought to be the goal. When you're thinking about how to structure things, first focus on liberty. He said, you are not to inquire how your trade may be increased or nor how you are to become a great and powerful people, but how your liberties can be secured for liberty ought to be the direct end of your government. So if you're concerned about, well, how are we going to get uh, better trade relations or this or that? The goal is liberty, and that should be the first thing. Now, this was, of course, when he's thinking about liberty, he's very concerned at this point and throughout the ratification debates about a lack of Bill of Rights. He wanted to see amendments. But going further, he pointed out on June 5th, when the American spirit was in its youth, the language of America was different. Liberty, sir, was then the primary object. And for Patrick Henry and many of the other anti-federalists, this is really a discussion about human nature, recognizing that we're all flawed creatures. Power always expands and seeks to grow. And when you get them together and you give people too much power, you give people a lot of power and you're going to draw the bad type of people to the top, and then they're going to keep trying to expand power in just very creative ways. And he said, guard with jealous attention the public liberty. Suspect everyone who approaches that jewel, because he's recognizing that there's some luminaries saying, well, this is going to be a good system. And he's saying it doesn't matter who's talking about it. Ultimately, if we're focusing on liberty first, we have to suspect anyone who gets close to it. And he said, unfortunately, Nothing will be will preserve it, but downright force. Whenever you give up that force, you are inevitably ruined. Now, one of the Federalist arguments, at least to the anti-Federalists, was basically trust the plan, trust the system. We've got, you know, the greatest minds on this is the greatest system ever created by man. And maybe that's the case. But ultimately, the checks and balances are going to work. And the people, you know, if there's a problem, they're going to resist. And Patrick Henry, well, he wasn't too certain about that. He said, show me that age and country where the rights and liberties of the people were placed on the sole chance of their rulers being good men without a consequent loss of liberty. 
And I'm just paraphrasing here to follow up, but he basically said, I say the loss of that dearest privilege followed every single att- every single such mad attempt. He thought it was insane to rely, to create a system where you're going to lie on good people getting in office and doing the right thing. Now, of course, that wasn't the totality of the argument on the other side, but that's a, a pretty serious warning. Now, and because you can't trust people with power, it's essential to avoid giving people too much power. That's called consolidation or centralization of power. And Henry, throughout the ratification debates, really tied almost everything in to consolidation, centralization of power. Here he is on June 9th. He said, if a consolidation proves to be as mischievous to this country as it has been to other countries, what will the poor inhabitants of this country do? The government will operate like an ambuscade. It will destroy the state governments and swallow the liberties of the people without giving previous notice. Hmm, Sounds a little familiar, really, doesn't it? And he continued. He said, when he asked my opinion of consolidation, of one power to reign over America with a strong hand, I will tell him I am persuaded of the rectitude of my honorable friend's opinion. That's uh, George Mason. He said that one government cannot reign over so extensive a country as this is without absolute despotism. If you have a one size fits all approach on pretty much anything and everything, you're going to result in total, total despotism. We're not absolutely there right now, but uh, the largest government in history, you couldn't be much closer. Now, he also warned against, uh, wait, for a little bit more on consolidated government. On June 5th, he said, if we admit this consolidated government, it will be because we like a great splendid one. So he's also discussing this kind of interplay uh, between, well, liberty was originally the, the, the primary object for the revolution. Now, here we are just a few short years later. And if people aren't thinking of liberty first and they're thinking of other stuff, then people have changed their approach. And that's to Patrick Henry is certainly very unfortunate. He said some way or another. We must be a great and mighty empire. We must have an army and a navy and a number of things. For Patrick Henry, you're either going to have liberty or an empire. It was impossible to do both. It just wasn't going to happen. And this was a little bit of a prediction. He said, if you make the citizens of this country agree to become the subjects of one great consolidated empire of America, your government will not have sufficient energy to keep them together. And he certainly, certainly called called that one and maybe he'll call it again but he also warned in other ways against centralized centralized power for example a standing army and one of the best ways even his opponent in the virginia ratifying convention his main opponent james madison recognized that one of the best ways to prevent against the need for a standing army was a militia now henry and madison disagreed as to the best way to deal with that. Now, the Federalists wanted a little bit more federal involvement, uh, general government involvement than people like Patrick Henry did. But like everyone, Patrick Henry was in favor of a very strong militia, an armed population as the first line of defense. And that's how he put it. The great object is that every man be armed. And he continued with, the militia, sir, is our ultimate safety. We can have no security without it. Again, Madison was on board with this mentality, even if it was different in the approach of it. Even General Henry Knox, who was the first secretary of war, uh, I believe in 1790, he put together a plan where he specifically said, we cannot have a standing army. This is not uh, this is not uh, good for the natural rights of the people. We have to rely. We need to rely on an armed population, a strong militia as our first line of defense. And again, his concerns over the power, federal involvement in power over the militia were the same as other issues. Consolidation or centralization of power is dangerous and was going to lead to all kinds of bad results. And he pointed this out over and over and over here in his speech of June 7th. Dangers are to be apprehended in whatever manner we proceed, but those of a consolidation are the most destructive. To Patrick Henry, the greatest danger came from consolidation, from centralization of power. And if you think about this logically, that means the way to deal with it, to w- the way to prevent those dangers is to decentralize. And that's why he was in favor of a confederation versus a consolidation. That's what uh, we discussed right at the beginning. 
And of course, in that situation, the the executive branch is going to be a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous tool as well. And he railed on this. But this is my favorite quote of all of them. Your president may easily become king. And even if it wasn't a hereditary monarch, certainly he was recognizing that an elective despotism, as Richard Henry Lee and Thomas Jefferson called it elsewhere, could act with the power of a king. And Henry put it this way. He is to be supported in extravagant magnificence so that the whole of our property may be taken by this American government by laying what taxes they please, giving themselves what salaries they please, and suspending our laws in Virginia at their pleasure. This was a pretty serious warning. And he continued discussing so many different ways that centralization of power was problematic. He went through various parts and various clauses. He certainly warned against a combination of the treaty power, the judicial power, and the supremacy clause. He said it would lead to a government violating individual liberty with impunity. That's from the overview of one of these episodes that I covered on these speeches is for speeches eight through 10. I guess if we're numbering them, I don't think they have any specific uh, uh, numbering system, but that was my best guess. I will link to that plus uh, a couple of other episodes, plus all the original speeches that I'm mentioning in this episode in the show notes. Uh, Alan Mosley will put that together and we'll have it available over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty at a couple of hours after this live stream is done today. We have all the episodes on Patrick Henry also at the bottom of that page. You just got to scroll down. There's all kinds of different categories. But if you're interested in just the show notes and the things that I'm mentioning for this episode, again, that blog post will be published over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to Liberty. Now, in his final speech, he was concerned that ambiguous terms, and this is something that came up for anti-federalists over and over and over, whether it was Brutus or Cato or some others, they were concerned that if you had ambiguous terms like general welfare, necessary and proper, things like that, even if you could explain the original legal meaning of it over time, again, this is recognizing human nature, people with power would always read as much power into that as possible. And then once you set a precedent for more power, that power would always keep expanding, expanding, expanding. But he was concerned that ambiguous terms would lead to a government of 10,000 implied powers. That was his phrase, literally 10 thousand implied powers. And maybe if you think about it with all the tens of thousands of rules, regulations, laws, orders, all that stuff on the books today, maybe he was actually understating a little bit, but 10,000 implied powers. And that in his last speech was actually the other end of the spectrum that he had been warning about in a number of speeches over the previous couple of weeks. That is, if you reserve powers by implication, if you only imply that the powers are reserved, rather than expressly pointing out that these are only powers that you have and everything else is reserved, then you're going to end up in a situation where the federal government would not act like those powers were the only ones delegated to it. Instead, it would act like all other governments before it, that all powers are granted except those expressly reserved. And he was very concerned, even despite the fact that uh, James Wilson and many other leading federalists were saying, no, no, this document without a bill of rights, without anything uh, spelling out that these are the only powers that they have, that's all it is. But Henry's like, OK, maybe that's the case, but there's really no other system that's ever been like this. So over time, again, human nature, power, these things that always have issues, especially when you put them together over time, they're going to read it completely opposite, that all powers are granted except those expressly reserved. Now, I guess in that way, maybe Patrick Henry was really one of the original 10th Amendment guys. He held that there really had to be a clear line in the sand between state and federal power. It had to be extremely clear, nothing ambiguous at all. And it's pretty similar in his approach that he took in response to the Stamp Act in 1765 when he was just 29 years old. He's always been kind of a line in the sand. You guys get to do this. And as soon as you go beyond that, if you give us a stamp tax, for example, that you're not authorized to do, then the people are not bound to obey them. Now, he did make a last-ditch effort in the Virginia Ratifying Convention to get amendments added before ratification, but it did end up failing by a vote of 80 to 88. Now, despite the fact that he opposed, he voted no. He opposed ratification as the document stood. Again, he was not against 
changes. He just did not like what they came up with without a bunch of amendments. Now, he was certainly one of the most influential people out there on getting the amendments that became the Bill of Rights. And in the summer of 1789, James Madison introduced, we know, a series of proposed amendments. August 24th, and I think this is an interesting twist here, the House ended up passing, the House of Representatives in Congress passed 17 of them and sent them to the Senate. In the meantime, Patrick Henry, who had been having some conversations with uh, William Grayson, Richard Henry Lee, Richard Henry Lee in the Senate, who they were going to be considering these, Patrick Henry isn't too happy with what they came up with, even with the 17, before they even narrowed them down further. He says, as to my opinion of the amendments, I think they will tend to injure rather than to serve the cause of liberty. And so he was not happy with that. And I think at some point I should cover either in an episode or maybe we should do a blog or an article explaining a little bit of why it's, he didn't really list out what he wanted, what he thought was bad, but he certainly wanted many more amendments. He actually made an effort during the process to get the house of delegates to actually reject the proposed amendments, reject the bill of rights and uh, a resolution that he had calling for the proposals Instead, suggesting what they had recommended in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, because when they ratified, they put together a bunch of recommended amendments. And so what he was trying to do at that point, once it got to them in late 1789, he's basically saying, hey, let's go with a broader set of amendments that lost by a single vote. And I think he made a strategic error. He had left early and he was the last guy he could have had the deciding vote. But he did get the vote delayed by, I believe, a full year. And eventually they decided to go with it. But by that point, here's a letter from Henry Lee to James Madison pointing out that, well, Patrick Henry was a little prophetic in some of what he warned about. He said, Henry already, this is in April of 1790, Patrick Henry already is considered as a prophet. His predictions are daily verifying. His declaration with respect to the division of interest, which would exist under the Constitution, and predominate in all the doings of the government already has been undeniably proved. A pretty good five-star rating on Patrick Henry's predictions there from Henry Lee to James Madison in 1790. I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. If you want to help us get this kind of important historical education out to more and more people, absolutely nothing helps us get this work done more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10th Amendment Center .com members. Again, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hope you learned something. Hope it made you think. I hope you have a great weekend and I hope to see you next week here on the path to liberty. Thanks so much for watching.